Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, today's Harvest Church Wednesday night service. I'm going to be doing things a little bit different tonight. I'm getting, you know, trying to get more back on a routine like I would teach in church. I've been spending more time just really um, <clears throat> trying to focus in on some of the struggles that you may be going through um, in your own personal life, you know, with everything that's going on with this virus and stuff. And tonight I don't want to talk about the virus anymore because I've had it up to here with the virus. I'll just let, let you know. But um, anyway, we're going to be talking a little bit different. So let me pray before we get into the Word tonight. And um, like I said, it's going to be a little different, but I think it's going to be good. Um, it'll take you some new places that you need to go. So Father, we just lift you up right now. And Thank you so much, God, for your goodness. And God, you know, every time we come to a point in our lives where we are, we focus more on you, it changes everything about us. It changes everything about our situation, changes everything about who we are. So tonight we're going to deal with some of these areas. You know, we're all looking at some different things. And um, I know in my personal life, I'm having to reevaluate some of, of the things in my life that I, I deem necessary. And now all of a sudden... I'm learning that there are some things in my life that are important and some things in my life that are unimportant, and I don't want to waste time on the unimportant things anymore. So, Father, as we get into the Word tonight, I thank you that your Holy Spirit will speak. I always want to give you permission to use me as your vessel. Never let me get in front of a camera or in front of people, God, and, and make it about me. I want it to be about you. So I thank you for your anointing in my life. And as, as I minister the word of life tonight, God, that you will speak into people's hearts and speak right into the messes that may be going on with them. We just honor your presence and thank you so much for your goodness. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen, if you will, if you can, amen. i um, going to be talking tonight about spring cleaning. Everybody say it with me, spring cleaning. You know, here we are, uh, you know, kind of in the spring of the year and, and most of us right now are at home and we're having an opportunity to go through some of the different things in our houses. And, uh, you know, so we're going to talk about doing some spiritual spring cleaning at this point in time. And that's going into areas that you hadn't looked at in a while. I don't know about you, but I've been, I've been going through a time here lately where I've been, I've been personally um, looking at, at different things in my life and looking, like I said, at the important stuff, the unimportant stuff. Figuring out what's necessary, what what is not necessary. Sometimes we can have things that are fun, and it's okay to have fun. You know, we're not supposed to be um, religious sticks in the mud where we we can't have any fun at all. So, um, you know, I've been looking at some of the areas of my life, and I'm figuring out there's some things that I need to clean up, and some things that I need to adjust, and some things that I need to do away with. Yeah, come on, y'all, and some things that I really need to change and make some movement a different direction in. So we're going to look at some of the areas, and tonight I'm going to try to get into um, what's, what's, what's in your junk drawer. I want to make sure I say it right. So, you know, you've heard the saying, uh, you know, how do you eat an elephant? And everybody says, well, you eat it one bite at a time. Well, I want to add to that just a little bit, and this is what I have down. How do you eat an elephant? Well, you eat it one bite at a time, but you don't, if you don't have any elephants, you don't have to eat one. How about that? So, you know, I think it's important for us to understand that there's some things in our life that we deal with that we really don't have to. There's sometimes we open up doors and we open up avenues and a self-evaluation sometimes will create an atmosphere where God can come in and speak some things and, uh, you know, and it can change us and settle us. You know, Pam and I were in a conversation a little while ago you know, because I, I preach on the verse of Scripture a lot if you're, if you're in today's Harvest Church on cast not away your confidence because within your confidence there is great reward. Well, when you obey the Word of God, then when times of drought come and when time, things hit you and you've been obedient to the Word of God, then you have every right to go, you know what, I've done what God said do. I've obeyed His Word. Now all I got to do is, hey, it's not on me anymore. I'm operating according to the Word of God, so I'm going to let, you know, I'm just going to trust God and see where this thing goes because God will never let you down. You need to understand that. So if you learn not to have any elephants, you won't have to eat them one bite at a time. The problem is sometimes we allow the little things in our life to grow into big things, and those big things are harder to handle. When we, If we stomp them out when they're small, um, you know, we could handle them a lot quicker and wouldn't have to go through near the things that we have to go through 
that, that if we just deal with the issues. So I'm going to take you to a, a verse of scripture that I read for myself, and you're going to probably say, well, why would he be reading this to us? Because self-evaluation is important regardless of who you are, um, what position you're in, whether you're just serving in the church or whether you're sitting in the church and and you know whatever the case, we need to self-evaluate sometimes. And I believe God gives instruction in the word. And one of the things that I do is, you know, when I, I come to these points in times in my life, guys, to where it's time for me to measure up. And what I mean by that is I, I have to go, God, am I doing what I'm doing because somebody else is doing it? Or am I doing what I'm doing because of fear? Or am I doing what I'm doing right now because, you know, I'm trying to measure up to what somebody else has is, is, is got going on? Am, am I trying to be what you call me to be? Or am I trying to live according to the measure and standard that you set in somebody else's lives? So uh, the question I have for you is how do you measure up? I mean, how do you measure yourself when you come to these times where you need to just evaluate yourself, reevaluate yourself, um, how do you compare yourself with other people? Do you compare yourself with other people, uh, with him or her and how she's doing? Or do have you learned how to compare yourself with the Word of God? Because if you want to compare yourself properly, then you need to stand against the Word. Let the Word of God be what measures you up. And this is one of the things that we're going to do tonight because we all have these areas in our lives where I call them slack areas where we can get slack concerning what God says. And when we, when we get slack concerning what God says, it's very easy for us to start missing opportunities, missing blessings, missing chances of growth, missing some of the things that God really wants us to get and get beyond a certain point. And we're stuck and we're stalled in that place. So Titus 1 and verse 7, we're going to read 7 through 11, and this was written to bishops. Um, you know, I like to say it's written to preachers, but it's always good for us to see because this is how I measure myself. I, I go through this, this portion of Scripture on a regular basis, and, and when I read it, there's sometimes it's really fun, and then when I read it, there's sometimes where it's really not fun, but I still need to read it because it's important that we... we reevaluate ourselves at some point in time. And this is what it says in verse 7, and we're going to comment on it, and eventually I'll get on into the sermon. You know how I am. It says, for a bishop must be blameless. Well, I'm at right there. I'm done. Because I guarantee you that I'm not blameless, but it goes on with a few more words. It says, as a steward of God. So, you know, we're supposed to live our lives the best that we can to the best of our abilities with the understanding of the word that we possess as stewards of God. Now, that, that doesn't mean that somebody's not going to bring an accusation against us. And, you know, when I, when I first got saved, I was witness to somebody, and, and uh, we were working at that point in time, and I got a little upset at a guy that I was working with because he was, he was really dogging me pretty hard, and I called him a rascal, and he thought that I called him a, a cuss word. And in, in his mind, I had cussed him, and he questioned me about my Christianity, but I knew I had not, so I had to settle on be, because of what I knew. And it hurt me worse to know that my testimony with him had been weakened worse than it did that if I'd have slipped up and said the word. So we reevaluate ourselves. Sometimes we're going to have things happen and we're going to handle them wrong. It's a part of life. We're going to talk about this some. But it says this, we, a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God. And then it goes into some things and I'm going to read through them and then we'll go back and comment on, comment on them just a little bit. It says, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, listen, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, and that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict it. Now listen to this. Verse 10, For there are many insubordinates, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. Now, uh, this is a challenging portion of Scripture because it goes into every area of our life. And if, if you... If you want to know how to impact your life, if you want to, uh, you know, and I hope some of you don't just click off of this because you're saying, well, he's going to be preaching hard. I'm not. I'm going to make it fun, but it's important 
that when we reevaluate ourselves or evaluate ourselves, that we give the Holy Spirit permission to speak into us. So I want to go back and, and talk, first of all, about not being self-willed. Everybody say it with me, self-willed. And, uh, you know, and I've, I've said this in church many, many times. I'm going to say it again tonight. Just because you have the right does not mean that it's right to do. You know, I have the right to respond to any and every situation that comes up, but also have to give the Holy Spirit right of passage in my life. And what I mean by that is I have to give him the opportunity to say, you know, there's sometimes guys when I would love to have the win, but for somebody else to have the win would be better at that point in time because one thing that I have to do is operate in humility. That's a, that's a hard word. And say, you know what, this is not about me. It's about them and see somebody else gain the victory because they need that victory in their life at that point in time. I'm not going to share any stories, but I have stories where that has happened. So when we talk about not being self-willed, that means that you, you've got to surrender yourself to the Holy Spirit to a point to where you say, you know what, God, uh, you know, this is something that I, I really could do, but is it, the, is it right to do it? Let's do it this way. Is it the right timing? I had a situation come up the other day where I had the opportunity to speak into somebody's life and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said to me, you can speak it, but it will not be received, but there will come a point in time where they will receive it, so save it. Man, is that not deep? Because, you know, we want what we do to be productive for the kingdom of God. It's not just about me getting it off of my chest or out of my spirit, but it's about it being received because, see, I can speak the word and I can release the word out of my own life, but if I'm not careful, what I can do sometimes is I can speak the word but the word's not received, so that word does not accomplish what God wants it to do. Now, God wants, sure, I got it out, and I got it off of me, and I got it out of me, but God wants it to accomplish what it's, what it's supposed to do. Not only to accomplish being released, but to accomplish being received. This is what it says, not be self-willed. You might have the right, but it may not be the right timing. All right, enough on that. All right, now, not quick-tempered. Boy, this is one that I, I, could, I, I really have to watch myself because I, I can really, we call it fly off the handle. But every time I start doing that, um, I realize I'm not, I'm not focusing on the right thing. I'm focusing on the wrong thing. See, it's the little things that build up and become big things, like we said already. Now, my daddy, um, you know, and I know some will be watching probably that, that'll know him, so I want to share this right. My daddy was known on construction jobs when he worked with Daniels Construction Company as uh, his nickname was Lightning. And I always, you know, when I first heard that they called him that, I didn't know why. But when I started working with him, I started understanding. He, was, he would hit somebody so fast. He loved to fight so much. He would hit somebody so fast to where they said it looked like a lightning strike. He wouldn't give them time to do anything. Well, just because I was his son, they nicknamed me Little Lightning. Now, I didn't act like my dad. Well, I did there for a while, but eventually I got... Well, it's funny how something can carry, can carry along your life if you're not careful and you don't handle yourself right and how one mistake can, or one time of reacting to something can follow you for all of your life. This is why it's so important for us to evaluate ourselves. That's what we're talking about. Remember, we're doing some spring cleaning, spiritual spring cleaning. So we're looking at our lives and going, you know, God, I, you know, if my temper is starting to get to a point to where I'm really flying off the handle, I label it this way, a little thunder and a little lightning. You remember, you remember the, 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 you want to you see a little thunder? You want to see a little, well, we don't need to be that way. We don't need to be so quick tempered. If you got people in your house right now and they're looking at you, yep, you're guilty. But you can also look at them because I can almost guarantee you we all have issues or, or things in this area. Now let's, let's, let's go ahead and, and do this. Look here, not, not quick temper, not given to wine. I think it's important for us to understand that um, when we let other spirits take over our bodies, we're not in control. This is something that you know you don't have spoken a lot of in church anymore, but um, I don't think we need to be given to wine because the Bible says it very clearly. So if you want to be in the spirit, be in the spirit of the Lord. Don't let things take you away from the spirit of the Lord because when you lose the right that you have to understand things, it affects you in a bad way and you make decisions. And I can't tell you how many times, guys, I have went to see someone who was in jail 
and they look at me and they said, I wish I'd have never took that drink. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but I'm going to tell you, this is one of the things that I, I'm not given to any drink at all. I, I just don't do it. I mean, you know, and even though I've had offers for it and had pastors who have offered that to me, I, I refuse to do it because I don't believe I'm supposed to be in bondage to something that God set me free from. Give me an amen, or you can deal with that between you and God. And then it says this, not violent. Everybody say violent. Brace for impact. You ever, you, did, did you ever figure, figure that out? When you got something bad to tell somebody, you know exactly how they're going to react. Isn't that terrible? You know, oh, you just come in and you say something and it's brace for impact because you know it's about to happen. Well, don't be given to violence. You know, don't be violent. You know, don't, don't react that way. Learn how to take things in and, and just sift them through your spirit before you react on them. I know this is no fun right now, but it'll be all right. We'll get beyond this in a minute. Not greedy for money. You know, never do anything for money's sake. And now this is talking about preachers, and I come from an area in West Virginia where the pastors were paid to do funerals, and they would fight over funerals, and they got a certain amount of money for them. And I had an incident one time where I went to do a funeral for a guy who was in my church, and a pastor was there, and he was telling me that it was, you know, that he had pastored the guy for years before me and should be the one to do the funeral. And I went to the funeral home director and told him and the family and said, let him do the funeral. And they said, well, it's not, it's not for him. I said, undoubtedly, he needs the money more than me. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have charged him anyway and because uh, I always gave that back. But, um, you know, sometimes we get in it for, for the greed of money. You can't be greedy for money. You can gain it all. This is what the Bible says, but lose your own soul. So what does it profit you if you gain the dollar, but you lose yourself doing it? So be careful. When you do this, make sure what you do, you do it for the right reason. Uh, and then it says in verse 8, and it'll get a little bit more fun here, but hospitable. How many, I mean, it, that word means um, you got to be a people person. It means that you're generous to guests. This is what it means. That when, when you see people, you just don't draw a reaction or draw, build a definition on face value. You get to learn who they are, and then finally, you can draw it from there. And then you figure out whether you can say certain things to them, or you have to stay away from them. So this is one of the things that we need to do. Remember what we're doing here. We're doing some spring cleaning, so I'm just challenging some areas of your, of your life. A lover of what is good. Know good and love good. Do good to everybody you come into contact with. Well, what about the person who doesn't deserve it? Never says here to do it if they deserve it. As a matter of fact, the Bible says it very clearly. I know this is fun too. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Think about it, guys. Whatever a man sows, that's what they also reap. So make sure that you're hospitable. Be a people person. Well, I don't like people. Well, probably people don't like you either, but they put up with you. You need to put up with people. Sometimes we have to be generous to guests. In other words, we're never going to win somebody if we never get around somebody. How do you witness to people? if you're not around people to witness to them. This is why this is so important. Be hospitable. In other words, give opportunity for you to minister to people. And we'll, we'll go a little bit quicker here as we get in, in a little bit more. You know, um, be, you know, be a lover of good. No good, do good. Be sober-minded. Everybody say that with me. Sober-minded means, the way I explain this word, this portion of scripture here, to be sober-minded means you don't allow things in your life to intoxicate you to where you don't know the will of God. To be sober-minded means to keep your mind sober. Don't let situations intoxicate you. You know, I preached a sermon a few years back. Don't get stuck in somebody else's weeds. We all have weeds in our lives, and if, they get, if I get fighting somebody else's battle with them in their weeds, I can't see the way out either. We're all in the same maze. How do you find your way out of a maze when none of you know where to go? Our position is to be above it. Our position is we're, we're here to help people but I can't fight for them if I'm in there with them. I got to be where God says for me to be. So to be sober-minded means don't allow those situations, the things, to intoxicate you. Let me let me show you this. I've seen people, and um, and I'm not talking about me at all. You know, I'm joking right now. That if you get into a situation where there's anger and anger is being released, isn't it easy how anger can just jump right on you? And before long, you know, you can do it with murmuring, complaining, you know, people griping. That spirit will attach itself to you. And before long, you begin to do the same things that everybody else is doing. I told you this is going to be like a normal Wednesday night service. 
So you get caught. What do you do? You get intoxicated by the circumstances. You begin, you're not sober-minded anymore. You've let the situation control your mind. Now your mind, will, and emotions are going to flow the direction that the situation causes, calls for you to flow instead of flowing the direction that the Holy Spirit says for you to flow. No, this is good stuff. Don't get mad at me. It's just truth. So don't allow situations to intoxicate you. Listen, but it says this, be sober-minded, be just. You know, be just. Uh, you know, I speak honestly to people, but I've learned how to do it in such a way to where I'm not just rude. Now, there's sometimes I say things and they are rude and I, and I don't intend to be that way. And then after I leave the situation, I go, man, I wish I'd have said that just a little bit different. I wish I'd have done it different. And I've had to call people up afterwards and say, hey, you know what? I, I really mishandled that situation. Don't be afraid. To, that's being just. What you're doing is you're telling them, look, I, I judged it wrong and I didn't handle the way I told you. What I told you was truth, but I didn't give it to you the right way. In other words, you know, we might be busy and we say something real quick and when we spit it out, you know, it comes out the way that we're in a hurry and we didn't take the time to deal with the situation properly. You know, to be just means you go back and deal with that thing right. Do it the right way and, and uh, you know, and, and pray sometimes and ask God, God, I didn't handle it right. Open up an opportunity for me to, to redo this thing. I've had that happen in my life. And then it says holy. Well, you know, the only way we can really be holy, now listen to this, guys, is, is because of what Jesus has done. But that does not, just because Jesus made me holy, does not mean that it exempts me from trying to live a godly life. And a lot of people today don't try to live a godly life. And what I mean, that's not wearing a tie, and that's not wearing sleeves, and women wearing dresses, and having your hair up in a bun, and no makeup. That has nothing to do with holiness. That's just man's way of trying to keep people in bondage. Holy means that I'm doing the best that I can do, and I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to speak into my life about the areas that I'm being challenged in. You know, and, and um, you know, some of, some of my things is, you know, I, I get challenged in the area of my eating because I, I could just eat sweets all the time. I'm being honest, but it's not good for you to do that. So I'm challenged in that area, and I, and I really have to let God help me in that area, and He does do that when I give Him the opportunity to do it. And there's other, so be, being holy means that you're allowing God to affect your life, to change your life, you know, and be uh, being able to speak into your life about, hey, you could have handled that different. How many of you know that changes things, it changes the situation. And then it says be self-controlled. Everybody say that with me, self-controlled. I always flip the two words if you want to know the definition of it. Control, self. Self-control means you control Self. Well, you know, the devil made me do it. No, he didn't. He don't have that power. He don't have the power to make you do it. He does not have it unless you give him the power to make you do it. And then he really don't have the power. You have the power to choose or not to choose. So be self-controlled. Everybody say it again. Self-controlled. Self-control is important. And then it says holding fast the faithful word as he, as he has been taught. In other words, we need to be practicing the word of God consistently that he may be able by sound doctrine to exhort, and that means to build people up and convict. This is part of our responsibility, guys, is to speak to people when they're doing wrong. The exhort, the exhortation of people is a fun thing to do. Give me an amen. But boy, the conviction to tell people they're missing it changes the whole atmosphere. But we need that spoken into our lives sometimes. This is what it says. Listen to this. By sound doctrine, be able to both exhort and convict those who contradict. So in other words, our job is to speak the truth in love. I need to say that, not brutally, but, you know, and pray for the way to do it. You know, delivery makes all the difference in the world. You know, if, if, um, if the UPS guy or FedEx guy comes up to my house and he walks on my porch and sets the package down and rings my doorbell and walks off, how many of you know, I, I usually catch him on the way back to the truck and tell him, hey, thank you, I appreciate it, have a good one. But if that UPS or FedEx guy, and we've had this happen, comes up and throws the package on the porch, his delivery was not proper. Yes, the package made it. This is going to make sense, I hope. Yes, the package was delivered, but the method was not proper. Think about that. See, and this is what we're called to do. We're called to deliver the message of God to people. So sometimes we need to pray about how our delivery is. 
and how we're delivering it to people because I've had opportunity to where I could have went fast with it and it would not have been received and I stayed and hung around for 15 or 20 minutes and opportunity presented itself. And then I was able to release that. And these are important things. I believe that with all my, my heart. So we, we have opportunity. Let's do it right. Verse 10 says, For there are many insubordinates. In other words, there are many people out there that are trying everything they can to get people off track. I, I have them do it all the time. You know, they try to, they try to, I, I have one, one person, I had talked with him a while, one person wants to change my whole theology because I'm wrong in the way I believe. You understand? Well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to give into that because I'm settled in what I believe. It doesn't mean that I, I don't need to grow. It just means that I got some foundational things that I'm not willing to change. You know, and I'm going to stay stuck on the word. Everybody say amen to that one. It says, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. Listen to this, y'all. There's customs, there's customary issues, there's things that go on, there's certain things that people do that may not be something that I need to do. You know, I have to judge that for myself. So what we need to do is instruct people on the word of God. Then you allow the Holy Spirit to speak into your life and he's able to tell you what you can and cannot do and what you should and should not do. Just be submissive to him and open to hear what he has to say. And it says in verse 11, whose mouth must be stopped, who subvert whole households teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. So we're evaluating ourselves. Spring cleaning is a time where we go through, think about this guys, we go through and we clean some of the things in our house that we normally don't clean. And so what we're going to do here in just a minute, and I'm going to deal with the first thing, and I'll tell you what they are so you can be ready. I'm going to be talking about your, your junk drawers, okay, in your house. And uh, I'm going to be talking about your closets in your house because these are things that we need to go through sometimes. And then, uh, you know, I'm going to be talking about your shoes, you got too many shoes, and you'll you'll follow you'll you'll get it as we get into this. Now let me read a, a weird verse of scripture. I told Pam that I was gonna gonna preach on this tonight, and she kind of stared at me. But um, I think it fits right in here. You know, we we are we live in our houses, isn't it? Isn't it amazing? And I try. She she gets on me all the time, and I hope she don't get mad at me because I come in and I pile my receipts on my dresser, and then uh, you know, and I pile things on the island right here, you know, and. And then I put things in the back room because the back room is my office and that's where I work. And every now and then she'll come to me and she'll say, see this right here? And this is what I'm doing tonight. See this right here, the island? I say, yep. Yeah. She said, we need to do something with this mess. Come on, y'all. Everybody say, can you say that with me? We need to do something with this mess. Say that with me. Because there's some of you women, you're saying that to the men. Some of you men are saying it to the women right now and you're saying it to your kids too. So we need to deal with the messes. But the truth, and I always come back and I tell her, well, babe, we live here. Isn't that so? I said, we live here. Thank God we got a floor that gets dirty. Thank God we got an island we can put stuff on. Thank God I got a dresser. I mean, that's, you know, in a back room where I can store stuff. But I also have to be uh, have, of the understanding that me keeping it cluttered bothers her. So part of spring cleaning and part of the, the evaluation of ourselves is not only looking at how we see things, but looking at how other people see things too. And isn't that just so much fun? But anyway, let me read this verse of scripture to you because the truth of the matter is, living causes messes. We're going to talk about that. It, Proverbs 14 and verse 4. This is in the, in the Passion Translation. And you're going to shake your head whenever I read this, but give me an opportunity. It says, the only clean stable is an empty stable. So if you want the work of an ox to enjoy an abundant harvest, you'll have a mess or two to clean up. The simple truth of the matter is life, doing what you're supposed to do, living creates messes. And sometimes you just got to go through and clean up the mess because this is the way it is. I go out in the yard and I got a pair of shoes and it picks up acorns because we got, I call them acorn trees or oak trees in the front yard and they will not fall off in the yard they will wait until they get in this house and they'll fall off in the house and i have to go through and pick them up and pam has to go through and pick them up and she tells me what about them shoes we'll get into this one a little bit later those shoes are picking up well yeah living guys listen to me just living life is going to create some messes you know what every day 
Let's be real. You got dirty clothes. You got stinky socks. You got stinky clothes. You got dirty dishes. Think about it. You got dirty floors. You got housework that has to be done. We got yard work. Wind blows around here. We got some trees. They just, if the wind thinks about blowing, they break a, a limb breaks off and falls. They're called river birches. I don't like them. But it's just living causes messes. Just living creates a mess. And this is why it's so important for you to understand that just going through life, sometimes even if you're doing your Bible study and even if you're praying every day and even if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, you still have to understand that, hey, you're going to have to take care of some things sometimes and God sometimes is going to speak into your life about specific areas that you need to change. I hope you're getting something out of this. So living just creates messes. That's the way it is. So let's deal with this one first. What about that junk drawer of yours? You know, I have we have one in the house and I had somebody, when they found out I was, we, we put it out that this is what we're going to be preaching on tonight. Somebody came back and said they had two or three and then somebody came back and said, hey, I, I need this. Go ahead and do it. You know, because the truth of the matter is, now this is my definition of a, drunk, a junk drawer. And this is what it is. A, a junk drawer is where you store things that are important at the time that you put them there, but become unimportant after time, or stuff your wife puts there because you left it out. I got to laugh out loud, so let me do it. So this, you know, it's just a place where you just put things and, you know, and I'll go, we'll go through our, our junk drawer sometimes and I'll, I'll pull stuff out and I'll lay it in a pile to throw away. And then the more I think about it, the more I say, well, it's important and I put it back in. So we end up cleaning some of the stuff out, but we end up putting a lot of stuff back in there because it's important stuff that I may need. It may be a screw to fit a chair or a screw to fit one of our blinds or a screw to fit, you know, something else in the house. I mean, regardless of what it is, we just pile stuff in there. But the problem is when you layer stuff on top of stuff and before long you need something, you can't find anything. So the unimportant stuff, listen to this, the unimportant stuff in the drawer clutters up the important stuff. It's the same way in our spiritual life. So when we're talking about, you know, dealing with the drawer, the drawer full of junk that you have, in, and I'm talking about in your own life here, you just have to remember, sometimes you got things in there that are good, but the bad things that you got in there just lay on top of the good so you can't find the good things when you need them. And if you're like me, instead of digging through and trying to find something because it's been misplaced or it's been covered up, let's get real, it's so much easier to go down and purchase something new and now I've got double in my drawer. So when we deal with things in our lives, and I'm going to go here for just a little bit, some things in our lives are good, some things in our lives are bad. We have to deal with them regardless. And there's some things in my life that may be necessary, but I just don't need them. Mm -mm -mm. I just don't need them. And we got to have the Holy Spirit speak into us sometimes. I looked over my glasses at you. To let the Holy Spirit speak into our lives. Second Timothy chapter 4 verses 3 through 5. This is in the Message Bible. I want you to listen to this. You're going to find out that there will be times when people will have no stomach for solid teaching, but will fill up on spiritual junk food. I probably should have labeled this one junk food. Catchy opinions that tickle their fancy. They'll turn their backs on truth and chase mirages. But you keep your eye on what you're doing. Accept the hard times along with the good. Keep the message alive. Do a thorough job as God's servant. So the truth of the matter is, God wants me to pay attention to my life. This is what he says. There, there'll come a time when solid teaching won't fit anymore. There'll come a time when we'll just be filling up on superficial food instead of eating what's right, instead of eating what's healthy. See, you can live all, I'm going to go here, you can live off a little Debbie's. You can. I don't know how long, but you can. You can live off of Krispy Kreme donuts. I don't know how long you're going to live, but you can. But it doesn't mean that it's what you need. And the reason why I say that is I want a Krispy Kreme donut. Anyway, you've got to make sure you got a healthy spiritual diet going on. But not only that, listen, the bad stuff in our lives, just like that drawer, and this is what this verse of Scripture is saying, 
cover up the good things, and before long we forget how to utilize the Word of God in our lives because we haven't been processing it properly. See, it's there, but we've allowed it to go dormant. And one of the things the Holy Spirit's trying to do in the church right now, I'm talking about not only us, but in the whole church, is bring back to life some of those things. Man, there are giftings, you know, there are gifts of the Spirit. There's power through the Holy Spirit that we've allowed the sanitizing and the cleansing of, of, of what the world has done to the Word to make it presentable to where we've lost the power to present the gospel to the world. And God's bringing that back. I'm telling you, we're in for a revival like you've never seen. It's prophesied in the Word of God that there's going to be a great revival at the end of time. And, and the church is getting ready for this. This is one of the things that's going on right now. You know, we have to be ready to do what God wants us to do, to, to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish. Because you are the church. And God says he's coming back for a glorious church. That means you're, you are going to be glorious. Well, amen. But listen to this. It says, you keep your eye on what God, what, what you're doing. In other words, you live your life according to what God's word says. Leave everything else alone. And then, uh, you know, God can open up the areas for you to, you, you to learn more. Except the hard times with the good. Now, I've seen people take this to an extreme where they believe the hard times come from God. And the hard times, hard times come from living, guys. It's just, it's just a side effect of being alive. Did you know that sometimes you, you're going to have, you know, I've, I've had people say it this way, well, it just seems like life is against me. Well, life is not against you. It's just, it happens. And sometimes, you know, you can leave your house and everything be going good. Somebody can do something stupid out in front of you and, and put your whole life on a side rail, put, you know, sidetrack you for a period of time. It has nothing to do with God. It has everything to do with living your life. And this is why, what the Bible says. You, you need to... You need, let me find my place here, excuse me. You need to accept the good times and the hard times. And what it means by that is learn how to, man learn how to maneuver your life through the hard times because God's word's true when it's the toughest. It's also true when it's the best that's ever going on. So fall on the word of God in all those times of your life and you'll be victorious. And listen to what it says, keep the message alive. Everybody say that with me. Keep the message alive. What does that mean? What does that mean to keep the message alive? In other words, you're responsible for what you do with the Word of God. You're responsible for it. You know, Pastor year, years ago said this to me, and I never have forgot it. said it to the whole congregation, and it stuck. And I like it when the Holy Spirit illuminates something, you know, puts sticky glue all over it and sticks it inside of you, and you can't get rid of it. And this is what he said. How many of you want to be closer to God? And the whole church raised their hand. He said, the truth is, you're as close to God as you want to be right now. That was Pastor Carl Morris at Abundant Life. Thank God he said that to me because it made me draw near. Do you understand, guys? It made me draw closer because the truth of the matter is God hadn't moved and hadn't went anywhere. He's still right where he was. If any movement has taken place, it's being me moving away from him because he stays. He's the God who stays. Amen. Man, that just, just got me in my heart. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He's a God who stays. Man, isn't he good? Isn't he good? Then it says this, do a, do a thorough job as God's servant. Well, you know, we all got spiritual junk in our lives that we need to deal with. And you know, what I'm going to do at the end of this and when we finish this up, this portion of this teaching, I'm going to pray with you and, and I'm going to ask you to ask the Holy Spirit to come in to the junk drawer of your life and begin to deal with some of those things in there that you need to get out of the way. You know, if we give him permission, he's good at cleaning up. And I'm going to read another portion of scripture here. Listen, you know, so cleaning, a, when you clean your drawer out, your junk drawer out, you'll find stuff you need and stuff you don't need. I mean, that's just part of it. Um, I love keeping screws, but I found out I got so many screws that I could give everybody I know screws, and I still wouldn't give all the screws away. So, I mean, I put up many blinds, and, you know, I, f I figured out how to put them up so I don't use all the screws in the pack, and I got packs of these things sitting down so that if one breaks, you got another one. Man, come on, y'all, really? Do we need to do that? How many times have we ever had to go back and pull up one of those screws? Same way in our spiritual life. We collect all this stuff, all these things, 
all these um, attitudes, all the words people speak about us, we put them in the drawers because we think they're going to be important later. We can use them for some benefit later on. I think what God's trying to tell us tonight is it's time for you to go through and get rid of some of the opinions that people have about you that you're holding on to so you can keep the opinion you have about them. So you got it in the drawer and it's covering up the good. You got to get rid of it. I know the Holy Spirit's speaking to somebody here, so I'm just going to, you know, we're just going to let him do it. But we need to keep an eye on the junk that's in our lives. And I, and I ask you this, how many times have you went and cleaned that junk drawer out and then just to find out, three months later, it's junked up again. Well, let me show you something in Scripture, and I want you to see this. I'm taking this Scripture and, and, uh, and moving it a little bit, but I think you'll understand as we get into it. And it's in Matthew 12, verses 45, 43 through 45. This is in the Message Bible again. It says, When a defiling evil spirit is expelled from someone, it drifts along through the desert looking for an oasis. Listen to this some unsuspecting soul that it can bedevil. When it doesn't find anyone, it says, I'll go back to my old haunt. On return, it finds the person spotlessly clean, but vacant. This is important, y'all. See, here's the thing. We can clean up, but just because we clean up one time doesn't mean we don't have to go through it again sometimes and say, you know what, God, there's some stuff right now I need to deal with. It's like, you don't take a bath or shower once a, once a year. You clean up every day. This is why it's important. Be in the Word of God every day. Let the Word of God evaluate you every day. Because I can almost tell you, you go a week without a shower, somebody's going to let you know. Well, spiritually, sometimes we get that way too. You know, and I'll challenge you right now. If you haven't been in the Word of God today, don't let this be the only time that you get in the Word during the week. Don't let Sunday morning be the only time that you get in the Word on Sunday. Be in the Word every day. Read a proverb a day. Go and get you some get you some private, some personal study books. Get you some devotional books. I got several of them. And I pull them out every now and then and go through them. I, I do my own, own thing sometimes. I mean, I, I do my own Bible study. This is where I get a lot of my sermons from, guys, is what God is speaking into my life about. But this is what he, re, he returns to that person spotlessly clean. He finds him spotlessly clean, but vacant. It then runs out and rounds up seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they all move in, whooping it up. Listen to this, y'all. That person ends, the person ends up far worse off than if he'd ever been cleaned up in the first place. Now listen to what Jesus says, and this is where I wanted to get to. This is why it's so important for you to understand. You've got to be filling yourself every day. I didn't say you get a demon, so don't go out of here and say, Pastor Rick said Christians get a demon. That's not what I said. I said it's important for you not to allow the junk back in your life because the enemy knows how to pile the stuff inside of you to stop you from fulfilling what God wants you to do. I've seen this happen, guys. I've seen people get hurt in ministry, been there actually, get hurt in ministry, and then make a decision because when we first moved back to South Carolina, I told Pam, you know, if I never pastor again, I'll be fine. You know, I'm okay with it. You know, and I, and I mean, I, I said this to God, God, if you want to leave me alone, I'm good. But how many of you know God's not like that? Because I have a call on my life. I'm anointed to be a pastor. Things happen sometimes that hurt, and I've watched things happen that hurt people, and the enemy, I'm going to say it this way, the devil uses it to knock them out of ministry for the rest of their life because they can never let it go. You don't need to be that way. Don't let the enemy control you to the point to where you miss what God has called you to do. you got to shake it off. I'm talking to somebody right now, you got to shake off the hurt. <clears throat> you got to shake off the circumstances. Okay, you got to trust again. Well, I'll never trust. you got to trust again because this is what God wants you to do. Now let's go here. Then this is what he says. It says, that's what this generation is like. Listen to this, and you'll know why I use this verse of Scripture. You may think you have cleaned out the junk from your lives and gotten ready for God, but you weren't hospitable to my kingdom message. And now all the devils are moving back in. 
Here's the truth, guys. If we don't deal with the issues in our life, they'll grow up and become so big it'll be hard to deal with them at some point in time. I know this from personal experience. If you don't deal with the hurts in your life, they will grow so big that the hurts can actually keep you from the abundance that God has for you. And it has nothing to do with God. It has everything to do with you. Can I get a big amen? So we're challenging ourselves. Here's the funny thing about junk in the junk drawers. It has a way of coming back. Whether we try to do it or not, junk has a way of building up again, doesn't it? Just like I said, whether you're putting it there or somebody else is putting it there, the junk in our life, it just has no trouble finding its way back. This is why I read this portion of Scripture. It has no trouble moving back in. This is why it's so important for you to evaluate yourself and to keep yourself humble and submit it to God. You know, this is what the Bible says. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. I have, I have people quote that to me all the time. But that's not the whole thing. Come on, y'all. Submit yourself, therefore, to God first. Then resist the devil and he will flee from you. So there's, there's something here that we have to do. We have to be in that position where we allow God to speak into our lives sometimes about these stupid little things that we are, did I say that? These silly little things that we are allowing the devil to use and manipulate us from doing God's perfect will in our lives. Listen to this. God wants you whole. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19. I got two more verses of scripture. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 19, this is in the Amplified Classic. It says that you may really come to know practically through experience for yourselves the love of Christ. This is what we have, this is what God wants for us, God. He don't want us just to know about him. He wants us to experience him. You know, once you once you have that experience, I mean to where that knowledge is one thing. But once you experience that knowledge firsthand, you know who God is, man, it changes everything in your life because then you start figuring out and you start understanding that, um, you know, there's going to be times that I do miss it, but God loves me regardless. And that God's not up there with a baseball bat or a stick waiting to hit me in the head just because I do one thing wrong. As a matter of fact, he'll leave the 99 and go find the one. You want to find out? I talked about this last Sunday. You want to find out who God is? Look at Jesus. And Jesus never went around beating people. Well, he did one time. But, uh, well, he didn't really. He, he run them out of the temple. But this is what he did. He always showed the love of God to people. It says this, which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience. So God wants us to experience him. He don't want us to have an experience or a knowledge without that experience of who he is. That you may be filled through all of your being, unto all the fullness of God. That means you may have the richest measure of the divine, of, of the divine presence and become a body wholly filled and flooded with God himself. As simple as this, we must make room for him. We must make room. Um, I had a pastor years ago that said something to me. His name was Burton Ross. And uh, I forget what country he was from, but he looked at me one time and he said, Oh, Brother Rick, how are you doing? And I said, oh, I need to improve. He said, Oh, that's a mighty big room. And I looked at him and said, Excuse me. He said, The room of improvement. And we all have that room of improvement in our lives. And it is a big room, no matter who you are. We all could improve. We all could improve on what we do. So this is what it's about. Let me read one more, and this is in John 3 and verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. See, cleaning out the areas of your life means that you got to just let him become more involved in your life. You know, Pam and I, we have this robot vacuum cleaner year, talk about it some and, um, and it goes around, you know, and just vacuums. It just, you know, you turn it on, tell it what to do with your iPhone, and it'll go and it'll just clean the floor. It's a wonderful thing. It's a one, I'm telling you right now, it's a wonderful thing. I bought it for my wife for Christmas. And it's the first time I ever bought her 
like an appliance, a vacuum cleaner, and she loved it. All right, so, but it goes around. But one thing we noticed is that it's not very good with corners. Corners. It, it, it's round, so it can't get into a square corner. It tries. It'll bump, and it'll bump, and it'll bump, and it's got these brushes that are out there trying its best to get it. But every now and then, I'll see Pam, she'll go around, and she'll have to clean the corners. She'll clean the corners. She'll clean the corners. Now she sweeps them out so the vacuum cleaner can pick it up whenever it goes by. Well, this is what God wants us to do, guys. we got corners that have become cruddy in our life. And you have to get down sometimes and literally scrape the corners out, sweep them out, so that the Holy Spirit then can make you clean in every area of your life. That the Word of God can flow into every... Am I saying anything to anybody? Man, I like being in church so I can, I can get some witnesses. I hope you're responding to this, but sometimes we just got to clean those corners. Listen to it in the Passion Translation and then I'm going to pray with you. So it's necessary for him to increase and for me to be diminished. This is what it says. If I want more God in my life, guess what? I've got to position myself and make room for more of God because God will fill every area we give him permission to fill. Now, how many of you remember the title of our sermon? It's time for some spring cleaning. I don't know whether we had any prayer requests tonight, but I tell you what we'll do. We'll pray afterwards, um, you know, for any of those requests. But let me pray for you right now because there are, there are some things that we need to, to do in our lives and we need to give God. You know, God has a word that can set you free. The Holy Spirit can speak into your life and bring freedoms that I couldn't bring. You know, all I am is a vessel to present the word of God to you. But the Holy Spirit is the power to make it come alive. So can I pray with you right now? So Father, right now, I lift up everyone that's with us, that's on Facebook or listening later. God, you see the areas of our lives and there's things that you want us to deal with. There's areas that we could be so much more spiritually efficient in if we would just give you permission. So it's time for us to get some of the junk out of the drawer, out of the way. So we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. If we've got everything else cluttering up this temple, how do we have room for any more knowledge or wisdom or anointing or anything else? So, God, I pray over everybody that's, that's listening right now and in the future. Holy Spirit, speak into people's lives. There's things that you're dealing with me about that I need to clean up. There's things there that I need to get rid of. I can get so caught up on the, on the tools and and things that, that happen, you know, in life that I forget, God, that um, there's something maybe newer, more practical, that would affect me a lot better, wouldn't be as hard for me to use as, it, as the old stuff was. So God, I'm asking you, Father, with every person paying attention right now, that you would just speak in their life about some stuff they need to clean up, let go, get rid of. Some of the cruddy corners got to go. It's time to clean them. It's time to let some of those feelings go. It's time to let some of that stuff get out of our lives that are damming up the anointings that you want us and the giftings that you want us to flow into. I thank you for that in Jesus' name. And maybe you're out there listening right now and you've never Pray a prayer of salvation. What I mean by that, Romans 10, 9 and 10 says this, if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. I love that. Not a question, if, and, or, but. You shall. For with the heart you believe unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So would you just do this right now? Just say, you know what? I believe Jesus in you. I believe in my heart. I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord and I believe I'm saved. I accept your gift. I accept remission of sins. And I thank you for your gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you've done that, if you prayed that prayer, please get in touch with us on Facebook or you can get in touch with us through our website. Um, 
we'd be glad to send you some information. I want you to know God loves you and he cares for you. He cares about every area of your life. Never forget that. If you're out there right now and you're wondering whether God loves you or not, well, he sent me to tell you he does. So just understand it. Find somebody that can explain it a little bit more to you and get caught up in the kingdom of God instead of in the kingdom of the devil. Um, I was asked to pray for small businesses, for the economy, and, um, and for things to be opened back up. Can I get an amen on that? So, Father, we just thank you for a quick recovery. We pray. I do it every day over our small businesses, over the businesses that I come into contact with. God, for our economy, there's an attack going on against this right now. I thank you, God, you got us in this place for a reason. You, you set us up to be here for the end of time on purpose. And I thank you, Father, right now that you're going you're gonna to help this country recover, not only back to where it was, but greater than it has ever been before. And I, I pray, God, for all the businesses, God, that you will bring hope and that you will impart into them, you know, what's necessary, God, to keep their eye on you because you're not going to let it go down. You're going to keep them where they need to be. We honor you with what we have. And, God, you're going to honor us when what we have seems to be lacking. And I thank you so much for your abundance flowing into people's lives. I thank you for our leadership, for our president and those in authority. I pray that they would have godly wisdom, not manly wisdom, but godly wisdom to do the right thing in Jesus' name. If you agree, would you say amen? Well, thank you for being with us tonight. I'm long-winded again. I'll never hear the end of it. But anyway, love you. God bless you. And we'll see you Sunday morning.